Jesus, Lord. Lord, today we thank you that you are our living hope, Lord. We don't serve uh, some wise man who lived and died 2,000 years ago and has a tomb somewhere. You are our living hope today. You are the first of the resurrection. Therefore, we, Father, also follow you. The hope we have, Father, is not just for this life, but, Lord, for the life to come. And, Father, in our world of such despair and uncertainty and wars and w- rumors of wars, our, our hope is outside of this world. It's outside of the realm of what people can do to help us. Lord, our hope is in you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so, Lord, this morning, as we continue to talk about the fruits of the Spirit, I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just uh, remind us, Father, how we are called to live while we are in this life. For we are yoked together with you, and because of that, we take on your personality, we take on your Holy Spirit, and, and Father, we are your ambassadors, the Bible says. We represent you in this dark world that so desperately needs to hear about this living hope today, for it is a living hope found in Jesus today. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Amen. Well, if you got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to continue walk, talking about the living by the fruits of the Spirit. Today we're going to be talking about patience, kindness, and goodness. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to, 20, to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly and in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will just be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're at conflict with each other, so that they are not to do whatever, so, so that you are not to do whatever you want, whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that, all, that, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to, the, to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking each other, envying each other. So this morning we'll be looking at the fruits of the Spirit, patience, kindness, and goodness. Last week I started off by discussing how Paul says, that we are called to be free. You, the sun sets free, is, is free indeed. But as we know that we say we also live in a free nation of Canada, but we also know that in the nation of Canada have freedom. There, there needs to be guidelines, there need to be laws that help guide our freedom to protect us many times from ourselves when it comes to, when it comes to, you know, Aren't you glad there's, as I said last week, rules to follow on the road, right? Aren't you glad that there's stop signs? And we all experienced when someone didn't obey the stop signs, and we've seen the consequences of that. There's rules, there's there's freedom, yes, but there's also guidelines that we are called to follow. And so we know in Scripture, God says, Paul says here, you're free. It was for freedom that Christ set you free, verse 1. What does it mean, though, to be free? Does it mean to allow to do whatever we want to do? But as Paul quickly explains what his freedom means, look up the last part, stand firm then and do not let yourself be indulged, uh, burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Don't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. A lot of people don't want to have rules. They want to say, I want to be free. And so they go into a lifestyle, they might reject the, the, the teachings of the Bible that they were raised with, and I don't need that in my life, I'm going to do what I want to do. But all of a sudden they realize they took the, 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 the yoke of freedom, and they took that off, and they put on the yoke of slavery. 
because of sin. And they face the consequences. They, although they claim to be free, we know that they're actually under a yoke. And all of a sudden their lives are full of addictions and problems. And that that's what controls their life. And I tell you, we have to have someone to serve. Bob Dylan wrote a song many years ago. Who knows Bob Dylan, right? You got to serve somebody, he said. It may be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And we all have to serve somebody. And God's calling us to take off the yoke of slavery and put on this yoke of Jesus. Amen? Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, Jesus says very clearly, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So he says, take my yoke. And what's the consequence of taking his yoke on you? He says, you'll find rest. Yes, life is full of challenges and and, and difficulties, but when we are yoked together with Christ, he will guide us through them. He will protect us. We are directed by the Holy Spirit. God begins to teach us how to walk in step with him. Just like two two oxen being yoked together, we're going to walk in unison. As I said last Sunday, walk in unison with the Lord each and every day. When we do that, we protect ourselves from all types of problems. The problem is when we decide to go our own direction, do our own thing, that's when things fall apart. So he says, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Verse 16. And verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And when it comes to these fruits of the Spirit, they are not traits that can be understood in, in, in of themselves. These are not natural traits that we want to live by. You'll look at every one of them, and we can all say there's times when we broke them. We weren't as loving. We weren't as joyful. We weren't as peaceful. Our sinful nature causes us to want to put us in charge of our yoke, and all of a sudden we find ourselves not being led by the Spirit of God. How many, even since last Sunday's message, you kind of blew it a little bit? Anybody? Oh, come on, be honest with me. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. We're constantly warring against a sinful nature where we want to be under our own yoke. I can do what I want to do. I can react to situations like I want to. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves getting away from these fruits that that Paul so clearly says, live by these fruits of the Spirit. These aren't yokes that come naturally. These aren't qualities that come naturally. These fruits are the quality. They are the character traits of Jesus himself, that Jesus love, right? He's joy, he's peace, he's patience, he's kindness, he's goodness, he's faithful, he's gentle. He's definitely has self-control, doesn't he? Aren't you glad for that self-control that God has? So God is these qualities, and so when you spend time with him, you take on his qualities. I think I shared this story, but my mom said many, many, many years ago, back in the 90s, she said, she said, when I was pastoring in Winnipeg with Wayne Parks, and she said, when you preach, she said, you sound like Wayne Parks. <laughs> I didn't mean to, but I spent so much time with this man and, and, and in staff meetings and at their house and all types of things that eventually this character kind of rubs off and my style of preaching even kind of happened like him. Well, I'm going to tell you, the more time you spend with Jesus, the more he rubs off on you, Amen. The more time you spend with, in prayer and seeking him and, and allowing worship music and all that type to just focus on him, the more you respond like Jesus. All right? So last Sunday we talked about love, joy, peace. And so today we're going to be looking at patience and kindness and goodness. Now I know the NIV mentions forbearance, but I'm going to use the word patience, which basically means the, the same thing. Patience. God is calling us to be patient. And in discussing patience, the first perspective we need to start with is God's patient towards us. How many glad that God is patient with you? Amen? He's patient. He's much more patient with me than I would be. I, I, I make promises to the Lord all the time, and I might even break them in the first hour. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? God... This is what I'm going to do today. I'm not going to get angry today, Lord. I'm going to treat my coworkers like, like you would treat them. And all of a sudden, not my coworkers, by the way. I don't pray that. I, my co, we. 
But how many times do you find ourselves in that situation where you, you, like, you, you promise one thing and all of a sudden something else happens? Well, let's look at some scriptures that talks about God's parent, uh, patience. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, Paul speaks about his own conver- conversion, how God was patient with him. For he says, for, but for th- that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst of sinners. Paul realized, he goes, I was the worst of sinners. Let me tell you, when you are condoning the death and imprisonment of Christians, that's a pretty bad person. And so Paul had to live with that conviction. He was under grace and he, under, he appreciated the grace of God and he lived by that grace, but I'm sure he always reminded himself who he used to be. And that's why he says to Timothy here, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his immense, his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Immense patience. Paul said, listen, he was incredibly patient with me. Incredibly patient with me. I, after all the things I did, he goes, and yet his patience was, was there so that he saw the long story. He saw the, what was going to happen down the road, that my life would be a, a testimony to others saying, if God was patient with me, he can be patient with you as well. If God can forgive someone that was coming against the church and causing Christians to suffer, then he can be patient with you as well. Romans chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead to your repentance? So Paul's talking to the Romans saying, listen, don't cast judgments too quickly on people because the same God that was patient with, with, with you is patient with them. Be patient with them. I mean, sometimes I can feel a little bit judgmental towards some Christians who I feel they're not on the same path as I am. You know, I'm here doing this for God and they're kind of back there somewhere and I'm like, oh, what? are they ever going to grow up in their faith? Are they ever going to be mature? God's saying, hey, wasn't I patient with you? You've got to be patient with them. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord. Remember I said a few weeks ago about repetition in Hebrew? And how it, is, it stresses the, 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 the importance of the situation. It's like three exclamation points behind the word, right? Or saying it really loud, or all capital letters. So this is what he's trying, the, the scripture is trying to get the point across. The Lord, the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithful. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. I want to say this morning, there's not one person in this room that has not benefited from God's patience. Amen? Not one person in this room that hasn't benefited from God's patience. Every one of us are here today serving the Lord today because God was patient with you. He didn't strike you down. He didn't just get rid of you saying, oh, you're just a waste of time and you're, you're abusing the, the cross and you're not appreciating my love for you. You're out of here. But God was patient with you. And that's why it says in verse 8, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Second Peter, the Lord is not pa- is slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I, I'm, strongly, I'm a strong believer that the time that we are living in right now, where the demonic activity is so blatant and so real, we can, you can almost taste it around us right now in the world, that God is allowing this to happen to awaken the masses. Do you believe that? I have, I have talked to, to more people who say, you know what, I, I, I see things now that I didn't see before. I see the supernatural in ways that I haven't seen before. 
It's, it's, it's so blatant. It's so real. And God is allowing these things to happen. He's allowing the darkness to, to reveal its true colors because God wants many, all, to come to repentance. He's waking us up. So I'm as guilty as anyone. I guess, hey, you know, Lord, getting kind of tired of this world around me. Just, could you just, like, rapture me out of here, Lord? You know, you know beam me up, Scotty. Take me out of here. Get, Lord, I want to go to heaven where it's all nice and peaceful and, and, and there's no persecution and stuff. Lord, take me out of here. We can all be tempted. We can all want that. The Lord's saying, yeah, I get it. I get it. I know you want to come home. But I got stuff for you to do. Because my patience needs to be your patience. The patience that I have for the lost, the patience that I have for your, your co-workers, your neighbors, your family members that might annoy you, that don't know the Lord and, and are critical of your faith, my patience for them needs to be your patience. They need to experience the patience of God through you. See, all these attributes, these traits that we read about, God says, I want them to live in you. You have to be the one who's patient. Yes, I'm patient, but you are my representative. You are my ambassador, and you must show patience towards those who sometimes you need, it, it, that it can only be a supernatural for it to happen. Truth is, when we begin to understand the depth of God's patience, how many think that that changes our perspective of others? Thank God, I mean, that guy is so vile, that person is so ungodly, Lord. I, but yet they still live. They still are blessed. Lord, I, God's going, I know. I'm patient with them. You be patient. You keep loving them. Ephesians 4 verse 2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, preach the word. Be, pay, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. You know, a lot of times we like the first part of that verse, don't we? Preach the word and be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke. We like those parts sometimes. Correct, rebuke. And then we've got to encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Wow. Be patient. Yes, we got it. There has to be correction. There has to be rebuke. But Paul is talking to Timothy about the church in this situation. We have to be patient with each other. We have to, there's times where there has to be challenges, but we have to do it in great love and respect and encouragement. And like I told you many times when I worked with Wayne Parks, that same guy that kind of rubbed off on me and I preached like him. There's times when he had to correct me as a youth pastor. You know, and, and, and he had to challenge me on something because I was in my mid-20s. You know, when you're young and in your 20s, you don't always think, you know, like you should. And, and I was a youth pastor, and sometimes I would do things and, you know, I think about insurance policies and all that kind of stuff. And he would just like, Dan, you know, you can't, you can't do that, Dan. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. We, we might get sued. <laughs> you know. And, 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 but yet, every time I left Wayne's presence, he loved me, and I knew he loved me. I just felt, thank you. Think about that. When people leave your presence, even the ones who really rub you the wrong way, do they leave that room? They may not agree with you. They may not even like what you said, but do they know in the back of their mind that you really do care for them? We know as parents like that all the time. You know, the Bible says, do not exasperate your children. Don't frustrate your children because your children, even when you discipline them, do they experience that discipline knowing in the back of their mind, mom and dad love me. They love me. I know they love me. I may not agree with them. I might be mad at them. I don't want to talk to them for the rest of my life. But I, I know they love me. You see, that's how we need to approach the people around us to say, God, I, I want to have your patience represented through me. So I'm not going to honk the horn at the person in front of me. Guilty as charged. I'm not going to speak ill right away when someone ticks me off. I'm going to be patient with them. 
How would the world believe that God is patient unless we're patient? If you tell people, you know, God's very patient with you, how are they going to believe it unless we who represent him show it? Because everything that God is, God is spirit. So they can't, they don't understand. If God's patient, then why are you impatient with me? If we're going to teach our children to be, that God is patient, then they have to see that patience in us. Those around us, we are, for, for those around us, we are God's representatives. We are God's handiwork, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9. We are his handiwork. In other words, his, another translation, his workmanship. We, we, are his, we are his vessels created. Listen, we are created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Think about that, what that says here. God prepared in advance for you to do good works. He put you in situations and says, okay, you're going to represent, you're going to represent me here. I prepared this situation in advance. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this guy was going to be having a, a rough time in his life. And so I'm putting you in this situation in advance. You are my workmanship, and I want you to represent me and show love to him and patience in this situation. I planned it already. You know, every single day, we have opportunities to display God's patience. We have opportunities to express God's character. And how many times do we blow it? God pre-advanced and said, this is what's going to happen this day. I want you to be there to say this to that person. And we miss the opportunity because we're so self-absorbed. We're so yoked together with the world and thinking like the world. And we're not listening to the Spirit. And God's guiding us along here, but we're so focused over here. And we miss those opportunities where we are God's workmanship we are God's handiwork created by Him to do good works, and we miss those opportunities. It takes time to do this. It takes discipline to do this. And I worked and pastored in Red Lake, and I, uh, I just felt in my spirit I need to work closely with the Native people because there were so many, so many Native people up there and a lot of homeless at the time. Entire life living on the streets. And I said, well, okay, well, I'm going to, you know. We, and we didn't have any Native people in our church, which was bizarre, I thought. You know, a quarter of the town's Native and not one Native person in your church. Like, what's, what's wrong with that picture? So I began to work with the Native people. And, and uh, I, you know, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. And, I, you know, they were many times intoxicated and in rough condition. And my name is Dan. And, and uh, who are you? I'm, 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 I'm the pastor. Uh, you're what? Pastor? Ah, get away from me, a pastor. And they hated, they hated the pastor because of their experiences and, and some of them, their parents or, their, or themselves in residential schools and how the church treated them. And I don't know how many times it got cursed at. It's just like, this ain't working very well. And I remember driving in the car with one of the church members and, uh, you know, I love his heart. <laughs> he said, he said, Fast, he's driving along, hey, Pastor Dan, you really like those native people, don't you? And I said, well, they're God's people. And he goes, yeah, once you're here for a while, you'll treat them like the rest of us do. I thought, no, they're God's children. I will keep loving them. But you see, his attitude was like, they're a waste of time. They'll never change. They've always been like that. And he gave up on them. And yeah, there were times when I really, these, some of these people really stressed me out as I was ministering with them. And, but our church began to do, to, we, I got on the shelter board and we, we purchased a brand new building. It was a prefab building and, and we gave a place for them to sleep and they had a kitchen and they had, they had, they had washers and dryers, they had showers and something they never had before. And as I'm ministering to these people and loving them, and, and it took time, it took commitment till finally they're, they're seeing me on the road. Hey, Pastor Dan! How are you doing? You know, they give me all kinds of nicknames and all that kind of stuff. But something happened because of the patience. If I would have gave up on them the moment they said, get out of here, I would have not have had relations. And some of them are today, every one of them, by the way, today is gone. They're in eternity. Every one of those that I've ministered to, they're all passed away. And some of them today are in with Jesus. I know that for sure because they came to the Lord. And, and they love 
They're, they're there waiting for me and you, and, and they're experiencing what we can someday just hope for to see happen for our lives, that day when Jesus will see. But they, they're there right now because of patience. And some people are very hard to love. But we're not called to have patience like the world. These are characteristics of Christ, and this, is, this forbearance, this patience that God's called us to is very hard. And it's not based on what they can do for you, but what God can do for, for them. When you are yoked together with Jesus, His patience becomes your patience. The next fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Kindness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, for forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Anybody here been forgiven by the Lord? Guess what? Somebody needs to be forgiven. And they may not reciprocate that back to you. They may not even care if you, if you forgive them. They may not, they might, like, you know, you might go to them and say, man, I'm really sorry that I, I said that the other week and I shouldn't have said that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm really upset at myself for doing that. And they're like, they could say like, whatever. Still don't like you. They could respond like that. But you don't do it for them. Who do we do it for? We do it for the Lord. When we seek forgiveness, when we seek to be kind with others, it may not always come back on us by them. But let me tell you, God notices. Amen? And by the way, you are able to live in freedom in your spirit knowing that you've done your part. I've had loved ones that I've had to forgive over the years. And some of them, it's been very difficult. But I did not want that person to have free rent in my brain any longer. I'm mean, talking about, right? You know what it's like? You're thinking about certain people that you're upset with and you lose sleep and you're just like, it's always like just that, that hamster wheel in your head is just constantly turning like, oh, that person. That's because you haven't forgiven. The Lord says when we are yoked together with Christ, we can take on his kindness, not our own. U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt said many years ago, and it was also penned by John Maxwell, I don't know, he kind of used it as his own statement, but it says this, nobody cares how much you know until you know, until they know how much you care. Isn't that true? Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Sometimes we are so inclined to let people know how much we know of the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And, and really, you know, Jesus was the Son of God. I think he knew a few things, don't you think? You think he was pretty smart? When he's there in the temple at 12 years of age and he's, in, he's inspiring the, the leaders of the temple, the priests of the temple, listening to him, that's a pretty smart kid. God incarnate was in the flesh, and yet... He, with all knowledge, did not attract people because of his knowledge. You see, the Pharisees had all kinds of knowledge, they had all kinds of wisdom that they studied and, and they went to school for, but that's not what attracted people to Jesus. It was his kindness. Amen? It was his, his, his caring attitude that it drew the, the sinners all around and they wanted to spend time with him because he was known as a what? Friend of sinners. His patience, his, his kindness. People were drawn to him. You know, like one, one night when we were at the homeless shelter in Red Lake, and my, my kids are like, how old are they? Now? My daughter's 27, my son's 25, my youngest is 23. And they were just little, little gaffers back then. And I did something, and I'm, I'm not here to, you know, brag. I'm just saying this was a moment that the Lord led me to, and there was one guy's name was, what was his name? Anyhow, his nickname was No Toes. <laughs> and uh, it's because he had no toes. And because of frostbite. And, and one, one night we found, we were having a Christmas dinner, we were trying to get all the homeless to the shelter, and, and my father-in-law lived up there at that time, they're driving around, they're, we're doing the list of all the people's names, okay, who's here, who's missing, oh, who's in jail, okay, he's good, okay, <laughs> that type of thing. And we couldn't find this guy. And 
And so my father and, and another gentleman in the church, they found him in a snowbank face down. And, and fortunately, they got him, and uh, he, he had not frozen to death. He was still alive. And he just passed out from alcohol. And he was soaking wet. He would have died that night. He was soaking wet. And we brought him into the shelter, and we're laying on the floor, and we're taking off his jacket and everything. And, and I took off his socks, and his socks were interesting. And, and I took off his socks, and, and then I took off my shoes, and I, I took off my socks, and I, I put my dry socks on his feet. I never thought anything about it, but yet my kids, my kids saw that. Dad gave him his socks. And they're like, wow. And I'm like, what? He needed socks. I, I had shoes. My shoes were dry. My feet were fine. And I'm not saying that to, to boast. Please forgive me if it sounds like a boasting. All I'm saying is that when it comes to the kind of kindness that God wants us to have, let me tell you, there's a lot of people right now who just need a lot of kindness. Who just need someone to say, hey, you're... Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. You're doing a great job. They just need kindness. They don't need a scripture verse down their throat. I'm not saying we shouldn't give scripture. I'm just saying we have to use wisdom and be led by the Spirit on when and how to say it. But the first thing they want is kindness, that you care for them. And some of those homeless people, I've told this story before, but when I did the funeral for Mary Kiwas, and I am telling you, I bawled like a baby. She was one of the homeless people, and she went to see Jesus, and I loved her like a little sister. And I couldn't get to that service. I'm sitting there shaking and trying to get, read my notes, and I'm just, you know, my eyes are all cloudy with tears, and because she touched my heart. And sometimes when you're kind to people on Christ's level, it always comes back on you. You know what I'm talking about? It always comes back to you. You'll walk away from that experience going, thank you, Lord, for letting me be your hands and your feet. It comes back to you. It isn't rocket science to be kind, but it is completely impossible to live on this level of kindness without, the, without being yoked with Jesus. It's, it's not easy sometimes. It's not easy to be kind. It's not easy to be kind, especially to someone who might be cursing at you. It's not easy to turn the other cheek. It's not easy to go that extra mile, but it's, it's essential. It's the calling. We are His workmanship created in Christ for good works. You have been created for good works. That is your role. Just like a car has been created to drive, you have been created to do good works. It's not an option. It's, it's your calling we are Christ's ambassadors. Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and 36 says, But love your enemies, do good to them, and, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. There's that ungrateful word. He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. How is he kind to the great, ungrateful and wicked? By us. We are his ambassadors. We are, we are kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Have you ever been, un, have you been kind to someone who's ungrateful? It kind of sucks, doesn't it? Can I use that word? You do something, and they're like, yeah, whatever. I remember it was on my honeymoon. Dominican Republic, 1991. And I was snorkeling. My, wife, my new wife and I were snorkeling. Lenise and I were snorkeling in the, in the, in the, in the breakwater. There's, a, these, you know, these, there's a, you know, the breakwater where the, bo the boats come in. And we're snorkeling. We're, you know, in three or four feet of water, and we're just looking at the fish. All of a sudden, I hear this voice going, Senor, Senor, Senor. And I look out there, and there's, there's an old man. He's, he's, trying to, he's trying to swim, but what happened? He was snorkeling, but he hit the breakwater, and it started pulling him out to the deeper water. And so I say to Lanese, I say, go get some help, and I'll go swim out to him. So I swam out to this guy, and, 
And I said, grab my hand. He grabs my hand, and I'm holding on to my snorkel and stuff. And I'm just, and, I, and the, way the, the way the waves are, when the waves go up, we started going out. When they go down, we're trying to get in. But the pressure, it's incredible how, how strong the pull is. And I'm like, I can't, I can't, I'm going to die with this old guy. <laughs> you know, I can't get this guy in. And I'm pulling, and just as well, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated what to do. I see a, a little sailboat come to the breakwater, and he sees we're in trouble, and he sails right beside us. And I grab the sailboat, and he grabs the sailboat, and we get pulled into the, into the beach, right? And into the shallow water. And I'm sitting there, and I'm exhausted. And I drop the goggles and the snorkel that I rented, and don't know where they are, you know, and... and uh, and he gets, he gets off, the, off the boat and walks over to the beach and starts walking away. And I'm standing there like... <laughs> you know, he's, just, he's just walking away. No sense of, oh, thank you, you know, for saving my life. Nothing! Not a thing! To this very day, I don't know whatever happened to him. And I thought, you little dog, you. You know, I almost died. <laughs> And he walked away and never said thank you. And I even had to pay for my goggles and snorkel that I lost. Well, sometimes people don't appreciate things. But the problem is that when we get our nose out of joint, it's because we are doing it for ourselves. But when we do it because that's our job, we do it because we are a child of God, it doesn't matter their response. It's... We're on duty 24-7. Therefore, if someone doesn't respond the way we want them to, that's, the, that's between them and Jesus. My reward's in heaven, and that's all that matters. Princess Diana, you remember her? She said this, carry out a random act of kindness with no expectations of reward, safe in the knowledge that one day some, someone might do the same to you. Have you ever paid for anybody's food at Tim Hortons? Isn't it, isn't it kind of bad when they order a huge meal? You know, you order a coffee, you know, and, yeah, I'll pay for theirs too. Okay, that'll be $30. Like, ah, what? I've had, I've had people pay for my coffee and stuff. It's never been a big meal, but, and I've done it to others. It's a good feeling when, you, when they don't even know who did it, Right? When you can walk away and say, I'm not even going to tell them that I did it. You never meet them again. You don't know who it was. But it could have, you could have been that God moment just at that particular time. If there's ever been a time in our world for some random acts of kindness, it's right now. Isn't it? In fact, I got a little homework for you. Uh-oh. Yeah, homework. Because we're going to follow up on this too. This week, this week, every one of you, I want you to do a random act of kindness. Not just one, you can do more than one, okay? And it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you maybe your time, your energy, maybe your finances. But there's something you're going to do where God is going to lead you because you are God's workmanship. You've been created for Christ, in Christ to do good works. So you're, you, you know, okay, Lord, I'm on duty. What kind of good work do you want me to do, to, to do today? What kind of random act of kindness am I going to do to someone in Steinbeck or Winnipeg or wherever God leads you today? And you're going to do a random act of kindness. It's not going to be like... By the way, I, I did this, for, I paid for your thing. To, you know, none of that. No one's going to get the glory except Jesus. What is it going to be? A random act. And it, it may, it make it as difficult as possible. Maybe it's someone that really rubbed you the wrong way at work, and you're going to do something really, really nice for them. And it's going to blow them out of the water. All right? You promise to do that? Who promises to do a random act of kindness this week? Raise your hand. Okay, so everyone look around. You see the ones who are not raising their hand? Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're going to do a random act of kindness. And next week, I might even call a couple up for a testimony. So it might be you, and you hate to be that person going, well, I, you know, I took my talent and I buried it. You know, that kind of parable story, right? You don't want to be that person. So I might call you up. What was your random act of kindness? What did you do? And don't lie, because you're in church, Okay. <laughs> Well, I saved a dying man, you know. No, 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 no. Maybe you will. I don't know. 
Next week, it's your homework. Last but not least is, is goodness. Any particular story come to your mind when you think of goodness? How about the good Samaritan? The good Samaritan. God's goodness that he wants us to live out can be very much seen in this particular story, the good Samaritan. It says here, a man was going down from Jerusalem, or to, sorry, yeah, from Jerusalem to Jericho, where when he was a- attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half, half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and, and when he saw the man, he, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. If you know the history of Samaritans and Jews, they didn't get along. Samaritans were considered half-breeds, they were considered non-Jews, they, they worshipped in the wrong city and you know, they didn't fully understand the law, they're, they're, they had some Jewish blood within them but they weren't real pure Jewish people and so there was this animosity towards each other and so Jesus purposely talked about the good Samaritan to the Jews and he kind of digs it to the, to the Levites and the, and the priests and he says, they would not stop They walked on the road on the other side because, you know, they probably had a schedule to keep. Have you ever noticed that doing good things comes at the most inconvenient moments? Right? You're on your way to someplace and and, and you're just like, I don't have time for this right now. God, someone else can help, help them. And that's exactly what happened with the Levites the Levites and the priests, they, they walked by, not even close, because, you know, that guy looked pretty dead. And so if you touch anything dead as a Levite or a, a priest, you know, you got to go through this whole ritual thing of, of repurifying yourself. So he looked pretty, you know, pretty messed up. So I'm going to walk by on the other side because he's gonna, he might get blood on my religious clothes and, 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 and affect my religious schedule and, and everything i got to do for God. And he walked by on the other side. You see, goodness... It's very inconvenient. To be good, really good in this world, is very inconvenient because people are not good in return. This man could not do anything to repay the Samaritan. In fact, it cost this man a lot. He could be, I'm sure he was on that road first to go somewhere. He wasn't just on some kind of holiday. He was on his way to Jericho for a, for a particular purpose, and, and so he, he, but he, he stopped his schedule, he gets off his donkey, he says, I have to stop everything and deal with this person. And he took his bag of goodies and he, he bandaged his wounds and he poured his oil, he poured on his wine to try to heal the wounds, to, to cleanse the wounds. And he placed that wounded man on his donkey, the Bible says. And he walked to that inn. Who knows how far it was. And he paid the inn inn owner with his denarii. Two denarii, by the way, which is two days' wages. That's a lot of money. He paid his money. And then he told the innkeeper, if there's anything still owing, I will come back and I will pay that off as well. You see how much sacrifice that was there? If we're going to really impact our community, if we're going to impact our world, it takes sacrifice in all of our parts. It's so inconvenient to to serve Jesus sometimes. (laughs) It really messes up your schedule. Because you got so much to do. I got so much to do. Places that, you know, places to plan for. And I got 
dreams and visions I want to accomplish, all of a sudden these needs, they come in the way, they come in the most inconvenient times, and, and sometimes they, you have to do things you just do not want to do. That's why you every day have to be yoked together with Jesus. Because when you're yoked with him, that's where he's going, that's where you're going to go. And so this week, this week, as you are yoked together with Jesus, I would challenge you. What's he going to tell you to do? Because he will tell you to do things every single day. You just have to listen to him. The Holy Spirit has to, will convict you. If you get in the morning and say, Lord, <clears throat> today I want to hear your voice. Show me what I need to do. <clears throat> show me what I need to say. Show me where I need to go. I am telling you, he will show you. And let me tell you, every time you do it, yeah, your schedule might be getting messed up. You, might not, you may accomplish the things that you never thought you'd do that day and not do the things you thought you would that day, but you will walk, go to bed that night going, thank you, Jesus. I did this for you. And it'll impact the people around you. It'll impact that person, but even the people in your own family. My kids, to this day, still know that sock story. I never did it for an illustration, saying, I should change this man's socks because one day my kids will remember this story. I'm gonna, it, was, it was just a, a random act that happened at that moment. And, and to this day, they remember this moment. That's how it happens so naturally. But we have to be led by the Spirit, in tune with the Spirit, and yoked together with Him. Amen? And that takes work. But that's when the fruits of the Spirit really live in our lives. Amen? Father, thank you. You want us, Lord, to be your workmanship. We want, uh, you want us, O oh God, to uh, do good works because that's what we're created for, created to do, go, good, to do good works in Christ. And so, Lord, today I pray that we, O oh God, would be sensitive to your spirit and be in tune with your spirit to do all that you've called us to do because so many times we miss, we miss the joy of the Lord in our life because we're so busy being unyoked from you. That when we are yoked with you, man, the joy flows because we are doing exactly what we're supposed to do. It might take our time, it might take our finances, it might be very inconvenient, and it might stretch us in ways you've never been stretched before, but Lord, when we do it, we rejoice in the end, knowing we did God's work. So Lord, lead us and guide us, and I pray the homework we do this week would be a very effective, not because people praise us for it because, Lord, we did it unto you. Even if it's a cup of cold water, we do it unto you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for using us for your kingdom and your glory. Amen.